Uh, good morning. We'd like to welcome everyone to St. Mark's United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Ken. Uh, today is the 10th Sunday after Pentecost. Uh, the announcements are printed in the bulletin. I think this is one. The announcements are uh, printed in the bulletin. We have one opening in August for flowers. But I do want to give an update on the, uh, our prayer page. Uh, we want to be in prayer uh, for Kim Clemens, Jean Chapin, Kathy Delvaccio, and Walls, Janet McIntyre. And we're adding uh, Rosemary Thomas to the list. So we want to uh, lift these people up. Uh, also, prayers for continuing concerns. You know, we want to be in prayer for people who are, um, you know, going through, going through difficulties and things like that. And prayers for concerns beyond our, our congregation. So with that, uh, I'll just let you look at the bulletin. I think there are other announcements that we'll be making at this time. And uh, go from there. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. You've been the first to hear the incredibly beautiful sound of our new baby grand piano, made possible by the very generous donation to St. Mark's by Matthew, Matthew and Julie Pring, who are friends of Brendan. Thank you so much to them. Um, we also want to thank Brendan for his very quick thinking and jumping at the opportunity to acquire this fine instrument for our church. Uh, the piano had to be quickly moved from the Prings home in Allentown um, before they moved from their house to establish a, a, a new location. So Brendan used his own money to have it moved. Um, so it, was cost, it, it cost him uh, just shy of $700 to do this move. Um, I think we all know, even if we didn't, haven't moved a piano, that that's a very expensive endeavor. So, um, the leadership team feels as though it's only right that he be reimbursed in a timely manner, which is obviously not in our budget. Um, this is where our congregation and friends of St. Mark's come in. That said, knowing how much the sounds of this piano will in enhance our music that we have at here at St. Mark's. Um, we hope to raise at least $1,000 as the piano will need some tuning and a little bit of checkup. And I know that's short notice for today, so don't feel like I'm saying, oh, you know, right away or we're gonna pass a basket. Um, if you wish to make a donation today, please use a pew envelope and mark it piano and your name. If you want to send a check payable to St. Mark's, please write piano on the memo line. This piano is a wonderful addition to our church and it's something that we would never be able to afford to put in our church home. This is our home away from home. You are our family. And this is a time um, like many other times right now where we've asked people to step up. So I'm asking you now as part of the leadership team to step up to this. Let's get Brendan paid off. Let's get, I didn't mean paid off, paid back. <laughs> and, <laughs> I came out wrong. Um, and, and enjoy this piano for a very, very long time because the music is exceptional. And once again, blessings to the Prings in uh, their new home and for their kindness in giving this piano to us. And thanks again, Brendan. Thank you. Please stand, if you are able, for the responsive reading of the call to worship. We are children of God, as, as brilliant, brilliant as a shining star, as wondrous as an ocean wave, as special as each fragrant rose, as unique as each falling leaf, 
We are, we are God's children. children. United in praise, humbled in awe, and, and prompted, prompted to sing. sing. And now let us join together in singing our opening hymn, number 89, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Psalm chapter 100, verses 4 to 5, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. The wisdom and doctrine of Scripture teach the experience of celebrating God is the core of worship. It is praise and thanksgiving, the most perfect manifestations of a heart that gratefully fellowships with the one who provides life and all the gifts of living. In fact, a grateful heart is not only the greatest virtue, it is the seedbed for all other virtues. We are caught up in the celebration of God. There is neither room nor time for the invasion of negative living. As we rejoice before the Lord, as we serve him in the area of our calling, as we enter joyfully into our daily journey, as we give thanks to him for his kindness and faithfulness, we should always celebrate God. God, there is nothing in the world that warrants a celebration more than you. Thank you for your saving work in my life and the world. Thank you for your goodness and glory. Amen. Our next hymn is 133, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Let us stand, if you will.
Our scripture lesson this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 24 to 35. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went into Capernaum in search of Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, What must we do to do the works that God requires? Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, What sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it was written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will <laughs> never be thirsty. This is the living word of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Gospel lesson of John. And as we study this lesson this morning, it really speaks to our hearts of what are we expecting. As we study Scripture, may the Holy Spirit come upon us. May we feel your presence. And may we feel the presence of the Lord. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, we're heading into the second half of 2021, and it's a good time to check our expectations for this year and for our future needs. Some of us have had a better year than others. Some of us have had a worse year. And all of us have certain plans and expectations for how the rest of the year will go. Are you optimistic or pessimistic about the next five months? Pastor Daniel Chambers learned an expression from his college professor in which it said, expectation is the mother of regret. Think about that for a moment. Evidently, that professor was pessimistic. Evidently, some of the things he expected to go well didn't turn out like he expected. But how do you react when life doesn't meet your expectations? Yesterday, I was coming out of a coffee shop in town, and a man came over to me and he said, Pastor, I met you several months ago. And I have to be honest, I, I, I really didn't remember him. But he said, I've been having a very difficult time. He said, my wife died three months ago. I have two grown children. She was my high school sweetheart. I never dated any other girl. And he said, I was really feeling lost. And he said, I just want to talk for a moment. And so we sat down for a while and we got to talk. And I said, well, tell me about your wife. Tell me about your family. Tell me about where your, your life right now. And he said, you know, I'm starting to feel a lot better through my children. I haven't gotten back to church, which I should be getting back to. But he said, I was staring into the abyss. I kept staring into the abyss. And I said, well, I want to quote Nietzsche. 
So I was reading him recently, and he said, when you stare into the abyss, the abyss will stare back at you. And when you think about that for a moment, our expectations and those things that we want in life may not happen. I think every one of us has some sort of dreams of what we want to have happen in our life. We may want a better job or a raise or a relationship. And heaven knows we're all confused about what's going on with COVID-19 and the other. I mean, this week is really um, not really clear what we should be doing. And we can see that right now. You know, some people are wearing masks and some aren't. But I will tell you this, that when finally something is being said that this is what we should be doing, then we have to do it. You know, it's something that we have to do. And there are many times in our life when we have to do something at the spare of the moment. A couple of years ago, when I was down at University of Penn, we were meeting one of our children for dinner, and I was in the book, Penn bookstore. And it's two floors, it's gigantic. It's run by um, Barnes and Noble. And I saw a hat in this little corner somewhere, <clears throat> a baseball hat, that I said, well, I want to buy that. It's on sale, but I'll get it after dinner. So I went out to dinner, <clears throat> and I went there, and we had a, well, maybe 45 minutes. I came back, and do you know that someone came and bought that hat? And that bookstore, so large, I didn't jump on the opportunity. And so I didn't get the baseball cap. Well, what's happening in our scripture lesson this morning? We see Jesus teaching, and people are coming. Large crowds are coming. What was their expectation? When you go to a concert, or when you go to the movie, or when you go somewhere, or when you pick up a book, maybe there's an expectation that you might have, and maybe that expectation doesn't come true. You, you are disappointed. Well, people were coming to Jesus and, you know, they're starting to talk. They said to Jesus, how can we really grow? They went looking at their own life, about their faith. What must we do to do the works God requires? And Jesus said, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. To believe in me, what I'm about to say. Now you see, just think about it for a moment. When they, when they took the fish and the loaves and people were beginning to share, people were fed. Were they coming there expecting to have a buffet dinner? Think about it for a moment. Were they going to Shady Maple or Dieters out in Lancaster County and then we'll go to see the show at Sight and Sound or whatever? He was giving them bread. But he said, I am the bread. I am the bread. The bread that you seek, you're going to be hungry again. Sure, you can eat the bread and you can eat the fish and you can share food among yourselves, but you are going to be hungry. Take the bread that I want to give to you. And then they started talking about Moses and the men that came down from heaven where God provided the bread to his people. They said, sir, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. If you take the bread of God, who is Jesus. Now I want to jump over for a moment to John um, chapter 19, verse 5, that goes several chapters ahead. There's that scene where Pilate is with Jesus and before the crowds. Jesus had a crown of thorns on his head. He was beaten. 
They brought him before the crowds. There was Barabbas over here who was a murderer, a person who wanted to have a revolution. And Pilate yelled out, Ecce homo, behold the man, the man right here, wearing the crown of thorns, who was beaten up. Make your choice. What do you want? Do you want this man or that man? And the crowd yelled, crucify him. Crucify him. You see, when in our scripture lessons today, Jesus is confronting people where they were, when they were coming forward. I'm not here to entertain, I'm not here to tell you something that's going to make you happy. I'm not here to say that I'm a good person or a good preacher. I'm here to tell you God's word. And I want you to listen about the truth about yourselves. It may not be pretty. It may not be pretty. And the crowds following Jesus saying, we'll believe you, Rabbi, give us a sign, feed us bread every day. You see, something is missing, and in this place we substitute all, all sorts of things. We say to ourselves in society, if only, if only I did this, or if only I did that. There's a true story of a young man named Steve Ben who was 18. He inherited $600 million from his grandfather, a successful real estate developer. Well, he got involved in the movie industry and he had some successful films such as the Polar Express, but he also invested a lot of his money unwisely. He also had children out of wedlock and he wouldn't support them. That was on the mother. I will not support these children. He lost all his money down to $300,000. And then finally he was able to see what a reckless life he had lived. He was irresponsible. And the sad thing, he died a very young man through his unhappiness. But what is missing is a sense of meaning to life. Why are we here? Where are we headed? What does it all mean? For many people, there is no meaning. There's a popular radio announcer in California and on his radio broadcast, he's, he talks about the dinner party in the afterlife. And he says, picture yourself going to dinner parties and you have meet different people and you're there and you're having a good time. But what will it look like in eternity at that dinner party? Are some of those people here on earth gonna be there? Are there gonna be new people sitting at the dinner table? Visualize who you would be if you gave your life entirely to the purpose and priorities of God. To put your whole trust in God and the community. To believe in the present and the future. The Anglican priest, John Stout, was a leader in the worldwide evangelical movement. <laughs> Remember a couple years ago we had the program uh, Alpha. And we're thinking maybe of doing something like that again in the future. But John Stout was very influential. He was the, the chaplain to the Queen of England for years. And as a young man, he realized, where's my life going? What am I doing with my life? He said, I was defeated. I knew the kind of person I was and the kind I belonged to be. And so he gave his life to Christ and to the ministry, and he had the same church his entire career. He never had another church. And he was also chaplain to the Queen of England. But he had to realize who he was and where he was going and what he wanted to be. And that's important for all of us. 
Are you living a sense of eternal purpose or are you just trying to keep up? Don't keep up. Go for the eternal purpose. Here was the good news for the day. It was to meet this need, to feel this emptiness that Jesus Christ came into the world. That is what brings us all to worship this day, to fill the emptiness within. Your identity and purpose and the best of life when you turn your life over to Christ is one of the most important things that all of us can do. And in many ways, we're living in a time of emptiness. We're, we're not sure what to do. We have emptiness. But we can have the bread of eternal life. And we can have purpose and meaning within our life. Don't work, he said, for the food which perishes. Work for that bread that is eternal. You see, there's an unsatisfied hunger that can be filled only by Jesus Christ. That is why Jesus can satisfy the eternal hunger. He is sealed by God. He is God's incarnate. To see him is to see God. To obey him is to obey God. To receive him is to receive God. And God alone can truly satisfy the hunger of the soul which he himself created and into which he put the hunger for himself. You see, the only true work for us as Christians is number one, is God's love. In our lives, there must be love and service of others which correspond to the love and service of God. And we need to be serving God, not ourselves. God is holiness. God is wisdom. It is the whole essence of the Christian life and this new relationship. When we look at bread, it sustains life. But what is life? What is life? Life is the newness with God. But that relationship is only made possible by Jesus Christ. That is the way Jesus gives life. With that, we have a new satisfaction and beyond life, we are safe. I'd like to conclude with the offer of Christ in life, in time and life, in eternity. It is that greatest and glory we cheat ourselves when we refuse the invitation of Christ and the moving of God in our lives. It's like the prophet Hosea who was married when his wife became unfaithful to him, never gave up. He prayed for her return, even though she went with others. He prayed for her, was willing to set, bring her back, and that's what God is doing. Maybe you have drifted, like Hosea's wife, but God is there with opening arms. Jesus felt the agony, the suffering, the misery of a godless world so intensely at a time when others were blind to its tremendous consequence. That he was able to experience in advance, as it were, the faith of a coming generation. Seek the world of God. Seek his eternal kingdom. Accept that bread which is Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for our scripture lesson this morning. Let us come to that meeting, not expecting to receive the buffet, but to receive that eternal, everlasting bread, which is Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Let us sing our last hymn. bright. I have borne my people's pain, give them hearts for love alone. I will tend the poor and the lame till their hearts be satisfied. Whom shall I send? Whom shall I send? Whom shall I send? And God's people said, here I am, Lord. It is I, Lord. I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you lead me. I will hold your people in my heart. Go in love in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you all. Amen.